but it's not going to stop you. The question is, how do you get it uh, certified and documented and approved? But if you would like to create today as the day of Mitch, you just go declare it. How about National Chad Lafarge Day? Speaking over you. Every day. He's so very good at it. Four minutes. Courtney, just a reminder uh, that heater behind you. I don't know if you got it warm enough yet. Oops, I think I was muted. Fantastic. Got quite the questions today. Producers have responded. And we can ask, we can have... Um, general education questions, because we have educators here in our first hour. Oh, enlightening. <clears throat> All right, Mitch, uh, how's my level now? I have my original sound on. How do you like uh, me now? Is that what you're I'll saying? I'll be freezing my quickie mart off. Very nice, sounding good. You're in the uh, 3.5 on the Richter scale. Unga shame. Courtney has the lowest voice of anybody here. He's not talking about the price. <laughs> has that been verified by Guinness? Just a, a ad hoc uh, survey. Yet another title I won't be contending for. That's disappointing. Well, he came, always comes in first in our voice limbo competitions. I got it. If anybody else didn't, I did. <laughs> Looking at some of the questions, does the... I guess a lot of the VR stuff, a lot of them plug into the NVIDIA, but I don't know much about plugging them into Max. Courtney JJ says that he's willing to compete with uh, low voice. He could probably do it. Break a leg, gang.
Hello and welcome to Office Hours. If you're curious about what we do, you can find out more at officehours.global. There you can be a producer of the show by putting in some of the questions as we answer about tech and media. Today, we have our educators with us. So all throughout our show today, we'll have, um, we'll have them with us. But our second hour, we'll be uh, turning things over to John. We're talking about uh, distance learning or distance tutoring. So we're looking forward to that. So let's get right into our questions. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Josh. Tom Williams from Desert Hot Springs, California has a question. I'm moving to a 550 square foot studio apartment in Las Vegas and I'd like to furnish it with equipment that is transportable and set friendly. Need a room divider, lights, tables, chairs, prefer off the shelf retail or used from a rental house. John? There's a great swap meet here in Las Vegas called the Broad Acres. They, they, it has a new name now, but it's on the north east side of town. And it's absolutely amazing. I've gotten all kinds of lights and speakers and computer equipment and furniture and tools. I highly recommend that swap meet. Uh, I thought it was called Broad Acres. Thanks, John. Keely. Yeah, I have a mobile setup here in my apartment. It's a, just a tiny bit bigger at 800 square feet, but I have many of the similar obstacles that you do. What I've done is put my entire rig on a rolling stand from Neewer and used various attachment arms to apply all of my hardware to that. And I just roll that around in, in order to accommodate my partner and, and other requirements. So if you have a look at Caleb Pike, at DSLR Shooter on YouTube. He's one of the most popular resources there. So I'll pop that in the chat for you and maybe you'll get some other ideas of ways you can configure your system. I love Caleb's uh, setups. I have uh, the fold-up stand that he recommended, was able to, to acquire a few of those and put those through. So good, Mitchell. Caleb is sort of like the professor on Gilligan's Island. Uh, you can give him a couple of coconuts. He can make a uh, C stand out of them. Nice. Let's go to our next question. Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. I want to place a wall-mounted pan-tilt zoom camera at eye level. Is there a standard height? Assume no stage or riser. Thanks. Good, John. I don't know if there's an architectural standard, but I've always used five foot as a, an approximation of where your face is. Courtney? And I'd be careful. It depends on what purpose you're mounting these cameras for. If uh, you're, it's a public uh, place or something, you realize that if you put them at five feet or five foot seven or five foot six um, in Florida, probably the average height is a little lower since a lot of people that are in, up in age like myself tend to go there. Um, it's, uh, you're going to end up with people standing in front of it if, uh, if it's not, uh, if the traffic isn't carefully controlled in front of it or if you're only going to have people standing directly in front of it looking at it. So be, be forewarned of that. Your shot could be blocked. Thanks for that. Let's go to our next question. Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Where would you start learning about augmented reality software and what do you recommend to test on the Mac OS? Yeah, I know a lot of the um, augmented and virtual reality software does plug into um, some external graphics. It's known for it's NVIDIA and some of the other options. There are some things that are, um, there are some options for like architectural. Uh, usually we have uh, uh, that the, the people use to, for, for visual as well. And I would assume that those also have, uh, you know, a Mac, uh, a Mac uh, client for them as well. So that might be might be a place to start. Let's go to our next question. John Preto from Las Vegas and here in our panel asking, I was watching a video last night of one of the AI leader CEOs. He mentioned that his company has licensed the image of two top boxers and history and are going to produce an interactive video. What are your thoughts? John. So here's here's what he said. They've licensed two images of the two top boxers, and wouldn't you like to see Mike Tyson fight uh, Muhammad Ali? But then I'd also like to take all the characters that I create in Mid Journey and create a story in there as well. And so I I could I also like to take uh, uh, Marsha 
from the Brady Bunch and have her fight what's her name from the Partridge family. So <laughs> I, I look forward to all kinds of interesting permutations with AI movie creation moving forward. Courtney? Well, sports games have been doing this for years. They've been licensing the images of, um, you know, football players, basketball players, et cetera, and sticking them on their little players in uh, in uh, 3D-based gaming. So I wouldn't – I would imagine there's probably already boxing uh, games out there that have uh, famous names and pictures attached to them. So uh, I, I don't know about the AI portion of it, I guess uh, – you could enter all the traits for each boxer and let the AI figure out who wins and who throws what punches and who dodges. Just keep hitting the refresh button, I suppose, if the outcome is not to your desired. Uh, let's go to our next question. From Clive Kitchener in Sook, BC, Canada. If you're going to purchase six or more HDMI cables, uh, would you purchase them from the nearest Best Buy, Amazon, Other World Computing, Monoprice, any brands to be avoided? Courtney? I'd go for monoprice. I, I had some problems with the thinner type of HDMI cables that work great, but then you'd start to bend them if you're going to be uh, connecting them and disconnecting them frequently. They tend to break. Uh, one or two of the internal connectors will tend to break if you move them around too much. Uh, I've been going with the monoprice. Uh, oops, not those. These <laughs> uh, that you can get from Amazon for about ten bucks that are eight K certified. Uh, I'll put a link to them in the chat. Good, Mitchell. If you find uh, some that work, I use the Pearl. I think they're called from B and H. Um, if they work for you, stay with them. Make it consistent and uh, try to use all the same ones. That way, you're, if you're reaching any limitations uh, on HDMI. You're going to be find it out very quickly because all HDMI are not created equal. It's possible to get the wrong kind. Next question. Next one in from Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. And here on our panel, how are some of the biggest Discord servers using the platform in ways that smaller servers are not? Keely. One of the biggest servers that I'm in is Harry Max server. I don't know if anybody's heard of him, but he's a freestyle rapper from California. And he looks like your dad. And he's just the best freestyler in the world. It's it's ridiculous. What he has in his server are a number of breakout uh, voice channels that people can join. And, and they're called ciphers. I'm not super hip, so don't get me on the language. But people can jump into these voice channels. There's music playing in the background and people can go in there and they can actually practice their rapping. So what people can do with these big servers is actually provide an environment where people can hone the same sort of skills that that server owner is known for and, and develop the community in a very inter interactive way. It is really, really cool. I, of course, would not rap in those rooms. <laughs> nice. That's really interesting. Let's go to our next question. John Filer from Greenfield, Massachusetts, asking, looking for a simple way for non-tech people to grab a ready-to-go setup off the wall and shoot decent quality videos with a phone and maybe a gimbal. Any thoughts or recommendations on a microphone setup for this? Yeah, Mitchell. I would start out with a small rig for... Uh, for the holder, the uh, cage to put the phone in, and then uh, travel on over to Rode. They have a uh, a bunch of different devices out there that work great with your iPhone, and make sure you pick the right one for the type of connector you might have on your phone. Yeah, and um, uh, DJ, DJI um, has some nice uh, gimbal options for them. Um, one of their latest versions of gimbal has an extension for their um for their gimbal and it's that's nice because oftentimes if you want like really low or really high shots um you can extend it by adding a pole to it but then you don't have the controls to be able to do some of the nice uh, effects for it so i have to say i'm a fan of some of the um uh some of the ones that have a few of the competitors have come out with that feature too but uh, those are those are really nice, and if you are um, if you are using that, you can mount one of the uh, one of the camera top uh, microphones onto the the body of the gimbal. Works. Uh, go ahead, Dave. 
I guess I'm wondering what the application is going to be. If you're going to be shooting and moving around, uh, yeah, a microphone is a big deal. Uh, but your microphone might not be pointing at what you want. That is, you're shooting, say, a big scene, and you want the mic to pick up the local sound not far away. Or you're walking through a room or with a person, and you're doing an interview with them, and you've got to compete with whatever noise the environment has. So directional mics from road and all that are, are going to be always what you're pointing the, uh, the <coughs> people toward but as well you're going to have uh, other issues that maybe are a second system consideration that you synchronize a recording device or a handheld mic uh, and have it record parallel with what you're shooting so that you can marry the two together later um, I think maybe Courtney's even got some ideas of this but it's always been a problem in terms of moving the camera while shooting and then having the sound move with. So I guess I don't, I don't have any recommendations for microphones for that. All the gimbal shooting I've done has been silent. And I know I've used the gimbal shots in my edits, but I've never sort of done a live stream with a gimbal and have to have, uh, I, I use lapel mics when I'm doing interviews with people uh, and wireless lapels and that for distance. But uh, I, I guess I would, I would have to look at the situation they're going to try and shoot in or the more normal situation they're going to find themselves in and then uh, acquire the equipments that for that system. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Rode makes, uh, as you said, a lot of solutions. There's a, a Rode mini shotgun mic. Um, it's about 34 bucks designed for going into uh, mobile phones if they have a headphone microphone jack. So if you don't have uh, one of those... Um, phones that were influenced by Mr. Jobs and have the headphone microphone jack removed, you would have to have a lightning adapter of some sort to uh, get into a eighth inch plug. Oh, uh, look, Mitch has one with a little hole in the bottom of it. Uh, so something like that would work. Uh, the other possibility is if you're using a DJI Osmo, which Osmo Pocket or an Osmo gimbal, the DJI microphones now come, this is the dual, dual version, uh, it boots up there, you'd see it. Um, has two wireless transmitters, and they're very small, uh, so you can put this on your talent and have them walk around. And this also has the feature of uh, being able to record internally in each of the wireless microphone headsets. So uh, you have a backup uh, recorded directly on the transmitter if you lose reception between the transmitter and the receiver. And they now make a version that's a little cheaper. That's about 325 bucks for the dual transmitter. They make a single transmitter version now that's uh, about $100 cheaper. All right, let's go to our next question. From Hazma Kajar in Cape Town, South Africa, in Zoom client with my uh, me as a host and one participant in a Zoom meeting, I don't have an option to permit local recording. Therefore, a Zoom ISO client is unable to launch an output engine. What gives? Yeah, and Hasmuk, I believe you'll you'll have to um, um, have that granted. Um, I don't believe you told us who the uh, you said it was with you as host, right, in the Zoom meeting. So, yeah. Um, Oftentimes, we'll use um, a, a bot in our on our after our sessions that gives uh, recording rights, and then you can you can launch the output engine. If you don't have that, then yeah, you, you won't be able to, to move that into the position to turn on Zoom ISO. So maybe do some testing with inside of our uh, little test bed we have. Go ahead, guy. Yeah, you. You might want to double check to see if cloud recording's on. If so, you might need to pause that and then go ahead and, and try it again because it needs to um, not have cloud recording started. So if you have your meetings enabled to automatically start record, cloud recording, pause that, start the output engine or restart it, and that should do the, the trick. Uh, Hasmic says no cloud recording is on. Try three people then. You might or th add another a third and see if that does the trick. Hmm. Yeah, I think there was an issue too, since you mentioned that guy, with um, automatic cloud recording setting in the pre-settings. I know some people were having some issues with that even before the start or whether they could they could get around that. But yeah, there's some things to, to check out. Let's go to our next question. 
Morgan Price from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I was excited when Andy Carluccio described the new Zoom polls to breakout rooms feature yesterday. How are panelists thinking it'll help their events or workshops? Go ahead, John. In adult education, a lot of times we have discussions as a, a major component of the classroom. And so usually what happens is if you're in a classroom setting, you just say everyone at your same table, you're a group. And what these polls features will allow you to do is things like, based on your answer to this question, I'm going to put you in affinity groups. It also makes it a lot easier to switch the groups up throughout a classroom setting. So you don't have to have the same group the entire day. You can actually switch people around based on how they answer the poll. And I think that's how I'll probably use it. Yeah, and if you've not um, uh, opened the polls for Zoom in a while, they've been completely rewritten, I believe it. Uh, Andy's told us. So a lot more capable before you had to do a lot of things ahead of time and set them up. So i um, really excited to, to look at this new feature. Let's go to our next question. Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia asking, after hours yesterday, help me set up my Mac M1, uh, mini M1, sorry. Uh, Zoom OSC Lite was on there with Companion and Stream Deck running. What are plus and minuses of this setup? Go ahead, Nigel. Yes, yeah, so I've been doing roughly the same thing, feeding through NDI into Ecamm. And I think it, what it is is the lowest entry point into this conversation. And so at uh, the simplest way, you get the basic Zoom system, you feed it into something like Ecamm or some other piece of software, and you can then mix and do ISOs, something like that. I think at the other end of the extreme is the, the deck link. It's the separate, um, you know, upgrading your ATEM to one that does SDI, all of that. I looked at that, and that looks like a $5,000 upgrade and a whole move from HDMI to SDI. And so if you take those two extremes, then you've entered the easiest, probably cheapest, uh, simplest, uh, but probably not the most flexible. And if you want to do more of a broadcast thing, you're probably going to have to go to the other end of the spectrum. But to me, it looks like the perfect entry point to get going, play with the stuff, learn it, and see how you want to use it. Okay. I wonder if Tony means Zoom ISO uh, light for that. Um, one of the that's what I took. That's what I took. He meant that he he'd got the basic Zoom ISO, not the the more advanced version. Okay. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing, like being in a show like this, what I think would be nice to do is have, for example, it would be nice to have, I have a, a teleprompter view and be able to have the gallery up, of course, is, is pretty simple, but also being able to have uh, active speaker to be able to have an overlay and to be able to have the program view and to be able to put it where you want. So being able to, of course, you'd have to have the permissions inside of the meeting, but be able to to be able to maneuver that. And Tony, uh, you have your own show, so perhaps having some custom views if you're using a Zoom contribution would be kind of neat uh, to be able to do that. And the light version uh, should be able to to let you pull that off. Uh, let's go to our next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. Asking, Video Pencil might be making my Insta360 link show vertical mode, and Video Pencil only works with my iPad camera on and won't overlay my M1 using the i360 link. Anyone have any insights into Video Pencil? Go ahead, John. When I first set up Video Pencil, I had some trouble getting the Video Pencil camera app to work on my Mac as well. And I think what ended up working for me is um, I had to reduce the complexity and really get down to, I just used my Mac's webcam and went just to try to figure out if I could get that much to work. And once I did that, and it took me going through the steps very specifically like Michael has on his videos, but once I did it and got it working on one camera, it started working on my more complex setup. So you might try that form of troubleshooting. Go ahead, Tony. I have been to the a video pencil school of hard knocks in that <laughs> in that um, initially uh, Matt Parker and a few other people from um, After Hours had taken me through all of the steps that you could do in order to get video pencil to work. And like Paul, I had all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. And it wasn't until um, Mickey Macature uh, actually went into my computer and he reset the way in which I installed Video Pencil 
application on my Mac that I was able to get it to work properly. And once I did that, it works fantastically. So there are no issues. I have no issues with it. But what I did, what I did learn is how to do it with NDI, how to do it with Memo Live, how to do it. There, there was, there was a, a whole ton, a load of different applications that I learned to use with Video Pencil. So there, there was value in that I didn't get it to work properly the first time. But I wanted to say to Paul, he might want to check the way in which he installed um, the Video Pencil camera app on his Mac. That was the problem that I had initially. Thanks, Tony. Let's go to our next question. Speaking of Tony, he's here asking a question. Tony Mobley from Newton, Georgia says, it is 2023 and now it's time to move from PowerPoint to another presentation move for your house of worship. Uh, panel, please put suggestions and links in the chat. John? I think the most popular house of worship presentation software is, is Pro, Pro Presenter. is a Mac first application and has some of the best features for a Mac uh, workflow. Media Shout is kind of the, the big gorilla in the room. It has a PC and a Mac version. It's a very, very old program, but both of those can do all sorts of different play out. And then if you're looking for something a little less costly and more nimble, OnSong is an app for iOS that has some of the core features as far as presenting lyrics on a screen with a background. Thanks, John. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, where do you see in-meeting Zoom question and answer being useful in place of an outboard Q&A system like Mukana? Go ahead, Mitchell. Well, there's uh, talk of uh, a program called Commenda as an add-on uh, coming, and it's very Mukana-like because it came from the same people. When that pops in, I think we'll have uh, a uh, consolidated program that you can use within Zoom to uh, put a question out there for people to answer. Yeah, I think anytime that you're asking people to use a second screen, there is that challenge of them making that jump to be able to go to another program. Uh, in the past, um, what would be really nice is if there was a way of going to a meeting where, where an app was installed and then having that app just by going to the meeting uh, available to everyone. Then you wouldn't have to have any pre-preparation. Still have to do both of that. Currently, uh, even the in-apps, you have to make sure that your attendees are uh, installing those ahead of time unless they're on a, uh, an account. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, one of the things I like about the the format in webinar is the fact that it it uh, segments from chat because chat can get very chatty, and so there's just lots of noise in there. And so segmenting those questions to another area uh, makes it easy for the presenter to just look at what's pertinent. Ideally, there's voting like we have. Uh, I haven't seen in this yet if it, in meeting if it'll have voting. But the other thing is the archive ability. So after a meeting, being able to take that for notes and not have to write it down, but you know, take action on those items after the meeting's done. So I'm anxious to see what the uh, archive is uh, beyond just having to manually record the meeting, go back and see what was said, but being able to have those Q and A's right there, so we can just you know grab that information, copy and paste, or or grab a text file uh, at the end and archive it. Nice. It seems like um, Zoom does want to kind of be that central place where they're holding on to a lot of things. So if they could take some friction out of this, um, they would be the they would, they would be in a good position. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it would be nice if uh, it all was consolidated, uh, so you wouldn't have to worry about things. I, I use one screen, um, and I have two programs active at the same time. One is Zoom, and the other is Mukana, which is our Q and A system, and I have to read from it. And the only problem I run into using this all on one screen is if they overlap, uh, whichever one has uh, 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 focus uh, will overlay the others. So if Zoom is, has focus, I'm not going to see the whole question when the, when the thing pops up. So there are some juggling going on, but I think we're heading in the right, right direction if we consolidate that into some kind of a Zoom app that's going to come out. Next question. Next one in from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. I'd like to know about an office hours like home automation community on Zoom. What would it take to bring this about? I think you'd have to have a lot of like-minded people <laughs> with an interest in home automation. I know there was a um, podcast 
uh, that dealt a lot with um, with automation, and particularly on the Mac. I, it's escaping me the name name of that podcast. Um, Keely, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I think that the notion of community, you have to embrace the fact that you have to have an asynchronous element in order to really foster that. So Zoom is very synchronous. <laughs> you have to be there and you, ha you have to be available. And that can be a major impediment. So you need to first build a home for that where asynchronous communi communication can take place. So like a Discord, obviously, or some other community platform like that, and then be able to hold your events that might be in Zoom or could be in that particular community app that are synchronous. So you have to start building with a place where people can pop in and they can contribute when it's it's most convenient for them. Mitchell? In a sense, uh, we're building that community right now because we have other unrelated or related uh, programs that uh, we are responsible for producing or helping. Uh, Conversations with Tony Mobley, which happens on Wednesdays, uh, Birding with Lois on Thursdays. And we've had some cooking shows and some band programs. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before we decide to do something else, and specifically uh, home automation. I think it could be spun off of uh, office hours and included as a lab and as part of that community in after hours, which has a great community and that discord that we were talking about uh, or Keely was talking about. Yeah, you might even set it automatically to start for you. Go ahead, Nigel. So I think there are two different communities here, and we should be thoughtful about which one we're talking to, not because they can't serve each other, but they are two different. And one is a homebrew community, which is people who build and install their own home automation. They want to know what works with what. And then there's at the other end of the scale, there is a professional community. And I think both of them have a role. And if you think about office hours, this tends to be a professional group that serves some enthusiasts, but it, it remains a group who are fairly professional, who are willing to invest in the equipment to get on and are interested in doing production. Now, that's separate from broadcast necessarily, but I think it, it sort of overlaps. I think the same is true in home automation. And so there are really these two different communities. And I think we'd have to really think which one we were serving because if it was the, the homebrew low end, you're not going to get the high end uh, home automation specialists on because they're not going to want to ask the question about why two things that don't work with each other never work with each other were never meant to work with each other don't work with each other they're going to be much more interested in how do i deliver a you know a luxury experience how do i use the higher end products and so i think there's there's probably a market for both so we'd have to be sensitive about which one we were trying to serve good point let's go to our next question from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas asks, "Could you see Apple bringing? <clears throat> pardon me. Could you see Apple bringing back liquid cooling to the Pro desktop in the Apple Silicon area? Uh, would a liquid cooled Mac Pro with an M2 Ultra or M3 give that much of a performance increase?" We have quite a few weighing on this, starting with Nigel. So I think the answer probably is no. I don't see that. I mean, there is definitely a market for liquid cooling in, in people who want to build their own particularly PCs and run them at ridiculous speeds. When I was at AMD, we used to have a whole homebrew group and you would watch people pour liquid nitrogen on chips and try and run them at ridiculous speeds. And, and you know, I, I was asked, what's the purpose of that? And the, the answer was, because they can. And that was really as much as what they were trying to do. They were trying to beat the world record for the speed of, of the machine. Um, that also requires certain things to happen in the processes and certain flexibility in the BIOSes and hacking them and making all of that work because you're really trying to drive something somewhere it's not meant to be. I think that, you know, the chips that are going into the Apple computers at the moment distinguish themselves by being able to run very well and not get very hot. In fact, most of us who have systems know the fans don't come on anymore. Driving those to the point where you could actually get them so hot that the, the air cooling wouldn't be sufficient, you'd actually have to physically water cool them. My guess is something that would be very hard to do and probably something that Apple doesn't want you to do. Courtney? Well, it's an unknown because it depends totally on the size of the case they end up putting it in, whether they decide to go with uh, a design for the Pro machine that can be, uh, that you can put 
add-on cards in. So if they design a case where you can add additional cards to, rather than typically the Apple uh, design was against doing stuff like that, a non-upgradable uh, lately in the last few versions of the Pro. Uh, so it, it depends on the case design, whether they need to put a liquid cooling, or, and it would be not a necessarily a liquid cooling like the one Nigel is talking about that a lot of the PC gamers use, but a, but a closed system that's a sealed system that's sealed copper sealed copper uh, pipes and heat pipes that just transmit the uh, heat from the surface of the processor to a radiator that can be put at the back of the, of the case with a large uh, uh, high-flow, low-velocity fan on it. I did see something uh, that came out at CES, which was interesting for laptop cooling, which is this uh, AirJet solid-state cooling, which is this... Um, uh, thing that's on the right here. This is a standard laptop cooler that's a close, it's actually liquid-based cooling. It's got a liquid in here that circulates from the processor up here down to the fan in the back of the laptop. But this new thing, which is the solid-state thing and that he's holding in his hand, generates a pretty good airflow, and it uses MEMS-based little tiny uh, actuators, uh, thousands of them on a surface that are vibrating up and down to generate an airflow that shoots a little jet out horizontally uh, from the top of the uh, of the processor that's if that little unit is mounted on top of a processor. So they could go with something like that would be innovative and keep a low profile and that way they could keep the case pretty small and slim. Did, did I imagine that the Power Mac, I think G5, had a water cooling option? I thought I thought back in the day uh, that that was a thing. Uh, go ahead, Mark. So I think if you look at the way uh, Apple has introduced the M1 series and the M2 series chips, they're always basing their information on power per watt. And it is the, it performs at this level using this much less energy than a conventional computer does. So it would seem to me with that lower wattage and that lower energy consumption that the cooling doesn't need to be uh, offset as much. So I don't know that they would want to bring out a new case that would have to be ta have room taken out of it by liquid cooling systems, and in then not be able to balance it out by adding more PCI slots or some kind of additional card slot. So it seems to me to go against the grain of what they've been shooting for, which is to reduce the energy consumption. Mitchell, yeah, I agree with Mark. I think he's spot on. Um, it just seems Stone Age to put a liquid cooled anything inside of an Apple product. It's so well designed. And they do go to a lot of trouble to provide venting and air circulation in such a way as to provide some cooling. Um, I, I kind of like the uh, the solid-state idea that Courtney was mentioning. I guess that's like a peltier uh, solid-state cooling device. Um, that seems to be where they'd have to go if they went that route. But I think Apple would probably design the box that holds that CPU in such a way that it's able to be cooled without resorting to using liquid cooling, which is... PC stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think we talked about um, earlier the difference between the Mac Mini. Uh, they've just recently updated some lines with the, some next generation chips and the Studio, and really the difference was that they had more room for cooling. It was active air cooling, but um, didn't go to the extremes of the, of a liquid cooling as well. And what some have found is that actually a well-designed air-cooled system uh, can keep up with some water cooling. Uh, it doesn't have as much of a thermal density, so sometimes you can ramp really good and it'll, it'll soak that uh, thermal density with a water-cooled system, but a, a well-managed active air cooling system actually does pretty decently. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I was going to mention that that air jet thing that I showed earlier is not a Peltier. Uh, Peltier cooling is, has been around for many years, but it has problematic in that it, it moves, it's solid state and it, and it moves heat across the Peltier. So one side of the Peltier device is cool while the other side is hot. You still have to remove the heat from the other side. So it, it doesn't really help you in removing heat. So you still have to have a fan to move the heat off the top end of the Peltier device. Uh, to make it work. The air jet thing that I mentioned earlier is actually a mechanical, uh, electromechanical device uh, that has little, little MEMS uh, modulating veins that move up and down very fast in a pattern that um, causes the uh, 
air to flow sideways through it, so it sucks the air up through, and, and it is it just moves air and moves it very fast and very silently. They're um, like bees. Bees do that. Yeah, cool yeah I'm not sure what it sounds like. It says uh, their, their promotional material says noise-free, so I'm not sure how loud it is since it's got little – the things that are moving are very tiny. I don't know if you'd hear it running, but uh, they showed it in, in the booth actually blowing, you know, uh, a little – uh, streamers, uh, so it was moving quite a bit of air uh, fairly fastly. Uh, here, here's here's kind of a look at how it operates. But um, air comes in the top and moves out the side with these little and it these little vibrating MEMS things that that are moving at a uh, in a wave type motion to move the air across the surface of this and out the edge of it. Uh, so you can see that uh, how tiny it is. And, in this video, promotional video from them. So it looks very inter a very interesting technology and in how they will apply it to laptops, and I'm not sure how much current it uses to do its cooling. That might be a consideration as well. And who are they marketing that to, Courtney? Is that a, so the end consumer uh, that uh, they're marketing it to? Or? Yeah, uh, no, th this was at CES. They're trying to sell it to manufacturers, obviously, of uh, its Aerojet uh Roar, F-R-O-R-E Systems, is the company that's manufacturing these. And uh, they're trying to convince uh, you know, laptop manufacturers and anything that needs uh, to move heat out of a closed system uh, in a constricted uh, area, as this would be a solution. Nice. Nigel? I also wonder whether, you know, the conversation around uh, water cooling a Mac is about doing very, very hard work jobs around compression or animation or something like that, where you're really driving the system over a long period of time very hard. And I think, um, and I wonder, I guess, whether Apple would tell you that the move to putting more and more GPU-type cores in the box is really to, to not use the central processing units, but using the GPU to do more and more of that work. And I think they will probably go down the elements of continuing to add GPU cores and writing software that uses those rather than try and use the central main uh, CPUs. Because where your Intel processors were getting so hot is where they were doing that work and you weren't using a, you know, a sidecar GPU. So it, it's really hard to think that, that architecturally that's the way they would want to reverse themselves into. All right, let's go to our next question. John Foltz from Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. John asks, can Keely Dunn talk about her work with Descript app? I used it for a training video and it worked great. Go, Keely. I, f I feel very singled out, and hopefully there's other people here on the panel and, and elsewhere who are using Descript for these kind of purposes. But yeah, similar to uh, the question, I'm using it right now to produce a course that I presented live as a workshop, and I'm whittling the six hours down to a more concise and much more articulate presentation for asynchronous use. So if this goes right, I'm going to try to show off uh, my screen. I don't, is that working for y'all? Can you see? Or I have to finish clicking share probably. And there we are. Okay, so I'm sharing my desktop. And what you can see here is the full uh, presentation that I made. This was about three hours long. And what I was able to do using Descript's new storyboard mode is to create scenes which I've basically designated as modules. And then by, by using those and then quickly exporting those into new compositions, I was able to create just that module of that video. I'm in the process. You can probably see that it looks like it's exporting a bunch of videos down here at the bottom. Descript does take a very long time to export the material because it's pulling the resources down from the cloud and onto your computer. Uh, I'm exporting those videos now, and then I'll be able to upload them into my LMS on my WordPress site and really quickly create something that's much more valuable. And instead of having to record an entire, uh, an entire workshop live and then do it again for an asynchronous presentation, I've got it all in one place. I'm then going to pull out the transcript and I'll be able to put that with the unit so that people will be able to search that as a resource. And instead of having to comb through the entire 
even five minute unit video. They can just search, find the term that I used, get to that resource really quickly for their review. So I'm really excited about using Descript for course generation. And Keely, just how um, independent have you been able to be uh, from start to, to end process of that? Do you find that you still do your um, brainstorming in other apps or are you able to do all of that right inside of Descript? I do. A technique that I want to try is to actually spit out uh, my preliminary notes of a script and actually just record that into a script and then be able to edit that down. I have a feeling that in in the future, we're going to be able to take our extremely rough cuts, for example, and then use that more intelligently uh, to generate a, a, a final script out of that. But for me, I've I've built my whole practice around live streaming. I'm really good at just starting to teach and getting a pretty organized uh, layout from there. I just need to whittle it down and and maybe take out some of the ums and ahs and and repeated phrases. So that's my main usage, but that is certainly a way that people could use Descript to, to generate their stuff. Nice. And do you find that them being cloud-based, uh, is this something you'd rather have them uh, resources locally, or is that not uh, really hamper you much? Well, I'm trying not to be the boss of Descript in that respect. I know a lot of people <laughs> level the criticisms at them for that because it is ungainly. It can cause some problems because of communication between the cloud and your local source. I have a one gigabit up and down connection, so that doesn't tend to be a problem for me. I'm always hardwired. I I, I don't live that Wi-Fi life as much as possible. So for me, it hasn't been that much of an issue and I'm okay as long as I know that I'm not turning around a project really, really quickly, I'm okay with this logger export. And for me, knowing that material is in essence backed up I have redundancy in there. That gives me a bit of peace of mind as well. Thanks for that, Keely. Go ahead, John. I always assumed Descript was just an audio tool, but it looked like there's some video editing as well. Keely, can you just briefly describe what it does on the video side? Absolutely. This is something that Descript has gone hard into, which is they've completely flipped their interface. And it did used to be almost entirely audio. And then what you were able to do was to bring in the video and you were able to edit the video in uh, by editing the audio. So you would look at the transcript and say, OK, I don't need this sentence in here. You would highlight that in the transcript, delete it, and it would delete that chunk out of the video as well. They've now moved to the next phase where you can actually do storyboard editing. So if you're very timeline oriented, I learned how to edit in iMovie and Final Cut Pro, and I've had to switch my thinking so that I can understand this entire storyboard editing. And, and you're really, it's heavily visually oriented where you are you can actually just move media onto a scene and it just replaces what you see. So I think for maybe the more entry-level editor, and they're trying to build courses, they're trying to build their YouTube videos and, and such, they're going to find this to be a really intuitive way to edit. The rest of us have to flip our, our brains a little bit, but it's it's an amazing, amazing tool. They have stock media built in now, so you can access videos and graphics that can augment your, your teachings. So it's it's pretty amazing. All right. Well, thanks, uh, John, for the question. And thanks, Keely, for showing. Let's go to our next question. From Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, te Texas, asking, I've got three generations of wise lights. Some are color lights. They're great, uh, except when they get turned off with the wall switch and lose contact. What's the beer budget fix for this? <laughs> go ahead, Courtney. Uh, well, if you don't have a 3D printer, you can find these on Amazon that are these wall switch uh, toggle plate safety covers, they're very simple. They just screw onto the outside of the uh, connector and slide up to prevent the switch from being turned off. Uh, yet you can slide them easily out of the way when you need to reset those wise lights. If they lose their connection, you have to turn them off and on three times to reset them to factory. They're factory uh, uh, settings, uh, you know, original factory settings. So that's a good solution. That was They're less than a buck a piece for you know, nine bucks for nine of them. Good guy. Yeah, I don't know what kind of beer Paul drinks, so it, it just depends on uh, tw if twelve ninety nine is is out of the budget. Uh, you can get the real wise switches, and with those switches, you can uh, you know turn them properly on and off. But it just does take uh, being being a little handy to to.
to strip the wires and because you could see it in the back this isn't just a, a wireless switch so on mine uh, we have some switches that are just like fake plates that go on the wall and that's how we alleviated it was using the, the fake plates but this one looks like you for 12 bucks you can uh, also get a three pack for 36.99 if you're using a bunch of them but uh, you can see how hard it would be just two wires the positive the negative and uh, you actually that didn't cut let me cut over to it there it is there's the actual unit itself on the wise website and then the way that we use ours as well is uh, just motion sense uh, activate it so that way uh, people in the household if you train them uh, that thing's going to go off in five minutes if there's no motion so they just don't touch the switch so maybe a piece of gaff tape over the top of that or the solution that courtney had to make it so people don't turn it off and then you just let the automation handle it all right, let's go to our next question. Tony Mobley, a new to Georgia, asking, now that I have a 14-inch MacBook M1 Pro and Mac Mini, how about I best use them with Zoom for House of Worship digital first events? Zoom OSC, Zoom Rooms? Yeah, and one thing you might want to try, um, Tony, is using, sometimes we'll have different bots that carry out different things, uh, such as presentation. So sometimes it's easier for having a dedicated machine that does your presentation and have one for your talent or for yourself. Um, the M1s are pretty pretty handy and pretty low footprint for that. Go ahead, Tony. First, I want to say thank you to Keeley for making the recommendation. I originally got a M M1... Uh, no, I'm sorry. I got. I originally got an M2 MacBook Pro, 13 inch, and she encouraged me, amongst others, in office hours, to get the M1 Pro chip, 14 inch, and I did. I'm very happy with it. A little disappointed that now the M2 has come out, but um, I am very happy with this machine. Uh, I just know that I am not utilizing it in the way I should because there's so much that I can do with it. And right now, it's just right now I'm using it as a secondary recorder for the House of Worship services. So I just wanted to get some ideas and, uh, from, from the panel. All right. Thanks. Let's go to the next question. Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, as a run-and-gun interviewer at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, what are the most interviews you think could be streamed in a day? And likewise, record the media without streaming. How long would it take to cover every CES booth? Go ahead, Mitchell. Months. It's uh, a very, very big uh, event, and it's also very hard to set up uh, an interview. It's not just a matter of walking to the next booth and beginning a conversation. You have to have a producer or somebody uh, pre-interviewing them to find out, A, if they want to talk, and B, are they willing to uh, answer your specific questions? And they're going to want to know what some of those questions are. Uh, others are, are, are good at uh, taking non-softball questions. And what I mean by that is uh, we want to interview them to find out um, ways that we like to use their product or would like to use their products. So that's a tough one uh, because it it may take an entire day to do five to ten uh, questions, something like that, or interviews or booths, if, however you want to measure them. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I'm with Mitchell on this one. It's the scope of the thing that's really intimidating. CES has hundreds of booths. If you allocate 10 minutes to each booth just for the conversation, uh, that's a thousand hours, and a thousand hours is a heck of a long time. The biggest thing I found in it covering any kind of large convention or large scale event like this, and I haven't been to CES, so that's probably way above my experience. But in the experience I've had, the biggest time spent is traveling from place to place. Uh, if you've got an interview booked at this end of the hall and another one booked at that end of the hall, and it takes you 30 minutes to actually physically get from one end to the other, and we found this at IBC as well, accounting for the travel time is a big deal. So just walking around CES is going to take a lot of time. Even if you went just from booth to booth to booth, the travel time is big. So yeah, it would take too long, and it would take a team maybe of 40 people to comb through CES with their cameras and recorders to do it as a recorded project, not streaming. Got John? My first CES was 1976 in the Rotunda at the Convention Center. I was, I think, 16 years old. 
And there's a reason why Comdex died because it's just inefficient. When the shows are this large and Guy will tell you, it's not even that one property. It's all over town. So you've got booths all over town that you have to get to and it's super inefficient. However, back in the day, CNET and Twit used to do a great job. They they had their own giant booth. CNET had, used to have their own giant booth with the stage on it, and then they would bring people, and then they would have a stage show. And then they had a glass a little offices, and they had all their video editors. So they had people out on the show floor grabbing footage, bringing it back there, and then they would feed that footage up to CNET. But that that is long gone these days. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, I think it's it's better to think of CES as not one show, but many shows uh, uh, under an umbrella. And we tend to see on, on YouTube and on television, we see the, the Samsung stand and the LG stand and the Sony stand, and we see these huge multi-million dollar stands. We tend to think that's what CES is like. Parts of CES are absolutely like that. But parts of CES are hundreds, if not thousands, of very small table booths where, where particularly the Chinese manufacturers and other people are demonstrating very individual pieces of technology they want integrated into future products. Um, and every year you'll see a completely different theme. I remember the first year that, um, you know, rockets became a big thing. And then there was the year that, uh, you know, that uh, 3D became a big thing. But not only are there the big manufacturers, they're really small people. So, yes, you could probably get round the multi-million dollar stands as a team in a week, but you are just never going to get round all the individual stands in all the individual locations that are selling the individual technologies. Courtney? And there is a, there are press events at CES that are designed specifically for gathering new introduction, and, and unfortunately, it's um, so you will see uh, the the day before the show open uh, show opens to the public, or two days before the show opens to the public. Pepcom and uh, um, what was the other one? It's uh, Showstoppers. C Showstoppers and CES Preview. All of these gathered together. Some of the exhibitors that are announcing new products into one location, and they open it to the press. And the press just go around this one room in one of the ballrooms, uh, where they can look at this. And each one has a small booth where they they have the products that they're introducing at CES. So you can interview them about their new products, and move from booth to booth uh, fairly efficiently. But um, that's only uh, just a small sliver of the 3,300 booths that there are at CES. And like you say, if you go to the International Pavilion, which is where all the international manufacturers come and they're seeking distribution in the United States and other countries, uh, where you know English is not their first language, so it can be difficult because you're having to, to speak to these people who manufacture in China and Asia and all over Asia and Europe, uh, small countries in Europe, uh, new products that they're trying to get to the market, and you can find some really interesting stuff in those little in, in the international market that ha has never seen the light of day uh, in your country, wherever that may be. So uh, discovery is very high amongst that, but you have to be very patient and try and find someone in their booth who can translate into whatever language is your native language, uh, because it can be difficult to gather information that way. Guy. Yeah, at Infocom, I was really intrigued by these uh, college students that were hired to run around and, and shoot every single booth. They had a team of these college students. So they they were just iPhone and Sennheiser um, mic, and they were just bam, 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 cranking them out. And then I went back and watched their YouTube videos. We were one of the booths. We had our, our one button studio we exhibited, and they came and interviewed us. And when I looked at the number of views on all their channels, like less than 100 on almost every single video. So it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And so if you look at our coverage of um, Cinegear, where you know we had a team and we had to, a two camera shoot and we were bouncing back and forth, uh, it looked great. It uh, co covered quality information, but also the fact that, uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but I knew the industry and I was able to ask pertinent questions and insider scoop. So they they came across as high quality because I was able to bounce back and forth with the people at the booth and talk, walk, walk the walk and talk the talk because I've played with their gear or owned it. And so it's, it's really a matter of quality over quantity. 3,200 is just way too many in four days to try and cover everything without a big team. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Um, 
Paul, of and in interviewing is the, the tricky part. So if you're someone that's knowledgeable, like Guy had said, you don't have to wait in line for someone to tell you about the product, but you can get your hands on it or show it to the camera and not have to wait or, you know, um, to, to get in line. And knowing who your audience is, I, I agree, uh, that's, that's important because uh, the chances of people just being able to find what they want through your your whole carousel of videos as opposed to delivering what they've asked you to want. Now we had sort of a, we, we cheated because we took everyone with us <laughs> and let them ask us. But um, most of the time you just have to know who you're shooting for. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah. Assuming a five minute interview and a 30% uh, shrinkage rate, we do need 18 people to cover all the booths at CES. Nice. All right. See, if we hold, hold off long enough, John can do the stats. All right, let's go to our next question. And it's for Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia. I want to test building virtual backgrounds for Zoom and other talking head type videos. Would the panel recommend going green screen plus an ATEM Ultimat or big 4K TV and why? Go ahead, Mark. Well, there's some challenges to the green screen. First of all, uh, you need to have a different perspective background shot for every shot, every camera you're going to have. And then... You may need more because as you zoom in and out, you're going to get out of perspective with your background. So you have to be aware that you need a lot of background shots. If you're going to build a virtual set, you need to have the set set up and then you need to get those shots out of that set ahead of time. Uh, it's not going to zoom in real time. You're going to have to go to another camera and such. Uh, with the 4K TV, the problems we found out with them was that if they're three or four feet behind the talent and you go to zoom out, you're going to see the TV and everything else. You need like an 85 inch TV set to be perfectly in place where we are in, in this setting here on this gallery. But um, so there are some challenges with it. Think a lot about your budget. The green screens are pretty expensive. The Ultimats work great, but you need one for each camera. And so I think there's other people on the panel that could add some more. Mitchell? Uh, Morgan, let's talk for a second. Um, I'm not a big fan of virtual backgrounds on Zoom. I've seen them abused in various ways, and they look horrible um, if you're allowing Zoom to do the key. Um, over a green screen, they're marginally better, and with Ultimat, they're even a little bit better. But it's a very complicated process to pull a decent key with anything. The lighting has to be correct. The, uh, the keyer has to be the right key. And a 4K TV, that's a lot of stuff that you have to make sure it works right to avoid things like moray and uh, uh, imaging uh, glare um, and just the physics of getting it the right distance. Like if I were to put one behind me, TV, um, it would have to be the right size at the right distance behind me in order to fill the, uh, the entire background. So I'm going to try to twist your arm a little bit and say virtual backgrounds, mm, just go with a real background. It's going to be easier on you. Sometimes it's the client's choice, though. We just got to got to carry through. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, almost all the cable news networks have gone to a large screen uh, flat panel display behind their talent rather than green screen and, and compositing. A couple of things to consider. Uh, you know, like like was said earlier, it's it's you know green screens can be very tricky to get tweaky, especially if someone with flat uh, you know flat. Uh, also, you don't have to worry about your talent showing up in a green suit or a, you know a green tie or a, you know green in their clothing. Uh, you, you know they may not be able to go home or have a change of clothes with them. And if you've got a painted green screen behind you, that's going to be a problem. Uh, so the the eighty five inch uh, four K display panels are now under a thousand dollars almost. Well, that may seventy five inches are under a thousand dollars, but within fifteen hundred dollars, you can get an eighty five. Uh, which is perfectly high enough resolution. You're not going to really run into morays as long as you keep them a, a foot or so behind the person. It'll be enough out of focus uh, that it won't be a moray problem. And uh, you don't have to deal with the key. The only thing you really have to worry about is the color temperature you're lighting matching the color temperature of the image on the background. So you have to match that up. But that takes all the compositing issues out. I'd go with the background, a flat panel display. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so um, we are now switching gears then to our second uh, our second topic, then for our education hour. We're happy to have our educators on, and John will be taking things over for us. Uh, John, what do you have for us? Thanks, Josh. Today we're going to be talking about 
supporting students outside of the classroom, especially remotely or distance tutoring. And so panelists will have an open discussion to start uh, to talk about um, just in general your thoughts or um, ways you'd like to kind of guide our discussion. And I'm going to ask our producers, if you have questions about supporting students of any age outside the classroom, go ahead and put those into our Mukana chat. Uh, we'll go ahead and start our conversation with John Preto. <laughs> no, we're not checking audio. We're going straight into the conversation. Did you have, oh. uh, we're going straight into, so if um, our panelists would like to raise their hand on the Education Hour panel discussion question, uh, we'll just start the conversation. Um, John, I think that was a miscommunication. Sorry about that. But I'll go ahead and start talking, I suppose. When I think of distance tutoring, I think of a few different axes um, that you can discuss supporting outside the classroom. And the first one is, is the education synchronous or asynchronous? In other words, does, does the student and the teacher have to be in the same place, virtually or physically, at the same time? Uh, and there's different formats to have tools for either synchronous or asynchronous learning. I think, is it personal or is it impersonal? And, and then I also think, is it one to few or is it one to many? And depending on where you're landing on these different scales, you might have a different tool to solve the different problems. For example, if it's personal and synchronous, you're thinking primarily of a one-to-one -one tutoring situation where you have the student with the tutor -er, with a tutor, I guess is the right noun there, sitting maybe in a Zoom classroom. And then if you think of one-to-many, maybe it's many students in a Zoom meeting with a tutor. And if you think of along some of the other scales, if you think less personal, there are some virtual tools. Like I know a lot of tools subscribe to Paper, and Paper is a service that allows students to text message questions to tutors. And there's no history of, of the students and which questions they've asked. They get, might get a different tutor each time, but they immediately have someone to answer their questions via text. Some other types of tools for tutoring might be uh, something along the lines of um, Khan Academy videos. That's a very impersonal, asynchronous way that a lot of students can continue to learn inside the classroom. So those are the sorts of things uh, that we might be talking about. So does anyone on our panel have any other thoughts or questions or comments when you're thinking about tutoring? And if not, we can go straight into our questions. Dave, what's our first question? Well, our first question comes from Morgan Price of Victoria, British Columbia. He's asking uh, for distance teaching adult learners using a flipped lecture style. What pre-recorded formats and media do you find engaging? Audio only, podcasts, animations, talking video, or none? Go ahead, Keely. This gets into really what the heart of what you're teaching requires. So I consider myself an educator, even though I'm doing that on YouTube. So I'm a teacher, but I play one on YouTube. And my material is very visual based. So I think that talking head with very helpful non-stock B-roll that supplements that actually illustrates the principles that I'm trying to teach is really, really effective. So I think that it it depends really on on what you're going with. I've noticed that uh, YouTube really, I think, has normalized the concept of teaching through video and having talking heads, you know, giving you that material. But we, we need to get a little bit, I think, away from the, the the stock footage being added in just as a filler, as as sort of a pattern interrupt, and really look at what can we add in visually that illustrates, that expounds, that creates more questions in the learners so that the learning can be a lot more effective. Thanks. Tony? I'm, I'm really kind of excited to, to answer this question from the standpoint that I think it's, it's right in front of our faces, that we are using after hours in the lab, the multiple labs that we are having in after hours and the training, uh, Ken's web lab and um, Rabbi David Paskin's uh, Stream Deck training, his Ecamm training, and we have so many, we doing the Zoom and OSC, we're doing all kinds of training and 
It's distant training. We have the ability to take control of each other's computers and, and, and show us different things. So it's, it's, it's staring right at us right now. And the other thing I wanted to say was that I think that for any educator who can afford a now $599 Mac Mini and an iPad, a video pencil solution is a great opportunity for instruction um, tool. And I, I would agree with those things. And when we think about the flipped classroom, it's the flipped classroom really started to become popular before the pandemic. And that's the idea of having your learners get the instruction on their own and then using the classroom time to do the assignments or application or assessments. Whereas traditionally, students go into a classroom and they sit and they listen to a teacher talk for uh, some amount of time and then they're sent home for homework. When the pandemic hit, teachers realized that that was not an effective model for teaching and it some teachers before that were already switching to a flipped classroom because you don't get to allow the students to take the time they need to acquire the information. Because if one student only takes five minutes to assimilate the information and another takes an hour, uh, you have a discrepancy between the two students. So when I think of a flipped classroom, I think what's the most effective way to pass the instruction from the teacher to the learner? And oftentimes with adults, uh, that tends to be most commonly used as video. Uh, and I think that's a really effective way because one video can scale to many people and it can be that asynchronous part of the class that we were talking about. So those are some things to consider when you're doing videos. Just make sure that you keep them short and engaging and uh, keep people's attention. Generally speaking, you want to shoot for a, a video that's less than 10 minutes, especially if there's instructional content um, or if you can break a lesson up into multiple videos, that would be even more effective. Go ahead, Julian. So um, for my students, if you want to use yeah, um, this kind of method to teach, um, I would also always look at the student and the material you have available. Like uh, for some topics, audio is just way simpler. Or for some students, audio is just simpler because if they don't have a lot of time but are adults, they can do it while they go back from school in their car or in the bus or wherever they are. Um, with video, this might be a problem. But then again, others are visual learners, so they rather have a video where you um, show them that in detail. And um, yeah, just look at the material you have. Um, if you have a very good audio, but only a, yeah, average video, you choose the audio. Great point about meeting your learners where they're at, because if you're... Um you expect your learners to be driving, you probably don't watch them wanting a, watch, want them watching a video. Keely? Yeah, just following up on what you were saying, John, about the flipped learning style, I actually needed to follow that up to, to understand what that meant from the educational perspective. But that's very much what the content creating community is doing a lot of. The big buzzword for 2023 is going to be community-powered courses. So what they're doing and then what they're focusing on is delivering the material asynchronously and then using the power of community to generate all of that q a that collaboration that extra support that can really push learning that material over and and up to the next level and increase course completion rates and success metrics so i think that uh it's it's, it's such a great opportunity with the technology we have with community platforms to be able to achieve that end and mark so we're actually using this flipped learning style in uh, professional practice where we're taking the salespeople from the radio station and having them watch videos that are put out from trainers from around the country. They get to watch those, then they get to present them after a couple of days to this, the rest of the sales staff and the actual lecturer. And then we have a huge question and answer session. And that goes through for about 10 or 12 weeks. Then we follow that up with our clients where we send them videos. They watch the videos and then they show up and the trainer, the sales brand company comes in and actually answers questions about the videos that they all watched. And it helps them focus their dollars and get a better return on their investment. John? This is a fantastic question. I work with the local company here that's doing online training for 22 years. 
uh, and and they're they're primarily video centric their platform, but they have community built in. They have gamification built in. They have leaderboards built in. Uh, but they have two challenges: creating the content for the content creators. It's always been a challenge, and then getting the the learners to sustain the coursework has always been a challenge. Those two things. Some other interesting stats is. 65% of their of their acquisition of their content is mobile first which is interesting and they've decreased the the length of their content down to 2 to 4 minutes in that in that length and to find that much more effective but but it's super challenging um i'm more concerned about what ai is going to do to the learning industry in the next 10 years that's more much more interesting and challenging and how we specifically are using the flipped classroom in my workplace is especially if there's a topic that um, the worker needs to have had some experience in between the time they hear the information and they apply the information so they can ask good questions. Uh, the most common, the biggest one for us is we have a e-learning assignment on the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act or HIPAA. And you can t explain to someone HIPAA in 10 minutes and you can thoroughly explain it in a, a very boring hour, which is what we used to do. But instead what we did is we broke it into four e-learning modules and we basically, um, when the first person first starts at work, we give them the, the 10 minute description version that they need to know before we can put them on the phones. And then after they've had a couple of weeks taking calls, we send them uh, the e-learning lesson with some sim simula scenarios, excuse me, and simulations. And then after everyone's taken it once a month, we have a question answer session. And so it really allows the learner time to not just hear the information so we can sign off on a compliance form that we completed it, but we actually put them in real world scenarios that they'll see at work. And we give them difficult scenarios that they shouldn't know how to answer so that when they come to the group meeting, which is usually 30 minutes, um, they can really ask more specific and targeted questions based on their experience and, it, and because of their challenge that they've received previously. What's our next question? Or for our next question, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about our um, general discussion. My apologies, I had a little bit of a snafu myself. Harshid, uh, did you want to share just generally about tutoring? Absolutely. So with tutoring, you have a a, a lot of methods you could you know deliver with, but most of the times is how can one learn and depending on distance. So is internet going to be something that you're going to drive your teachings around or is it going to be the content? So for me specifically, uh, unfortunately, if the pandemic made us all have to learn distance wise, but the screen reader was a big impact to a lot of people because it get, if they didn't have anybody to go ask for help, how are they able to read the information off their screens or deliver, you know, get food delivered, DoorDash, et cetera. So it became, how can I tutor this person to even use something as simple as that or a child at that matter? And so I used uh, some elements of having the person, for example, will take the screen reader aspect to read the tutorial or the table of contents that was within the screen reader. The specific one I'm talking about is called JAWS, Job Access with Speech. And so it's a Windows-based screen reader and it has a table of contents. But if one might go through chapter one, let's just say, and then you talk to them on the phone, and then you connect to their computer via the facilities that are built into the application called Tandem, then it is a easier conversation to have because it's that post and pre conversation that that was necessary that, hey, these are the things I want to talk about. And then here are the things that we're going to learn about today while we are on a conversation. So what that does is it saves us time. Uh, time is, is inevitable that it runs away from you every second as it is now. But we need to make sure that we have enough time that we're getting to the points that we want to learn instead of, well, what do you want to learn about today? Uh, I don't know. You're the teacher, right? That's maybe the student's answer. So we want to make sure that we have a, a set uh, regimen, perhaps. Uh, other elements that I've seen in the pandemic, uh, what started it off was having YouTube videos or shorter videos. And I think that's what even some of this uh, shorts and, you know, Insta reels and stuff, that's what it drived on because information for us is important, but if you make it too long, we're going to go to sleep or it's not going to catch you. So how do you make that interesting to any uh, child or adult with factors of if it's distance? So the other factor to check, we talked about it here earlier, is audio. Um, can I actually hear you? Are you 
understanding what I'm saying. And then internet. Do you have the person that might be in a rural country have proper internet and maybe, you know, you're trying to learn a new language. Uh, Another quick example, I had a friend that is from uh, the West Coast and wanted to learn Irish. So she has a tutor teaching her Gaelic right from Ireland, but she uses a screen reader and all of the functional things. But it's how to, you know, how to expand on that. How do you get windows to do the characters? How do you get special characters? And it made it more of a learning tool to not just learn the language, but how to write the language. How does it look? How does it sound? So it encompasses everything that we know as humans is what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell. So just make sure we try to get as many of those senses together. Thanks. And Josh? Yeah, I would think that the experience of the last three years has uh, sort of been an aid to decentralizing where education comes from. And I think tutor tutoring is a huge boon for that. Um, you know, in the past, we would probably uh, think of that as something that's made with a prescription. It's something that happens on premise and, you know, happens with prescribed people from a specific organization. But really, you could reach out, you know, without a prescription and get aid or help on just about any topic that you want. And, um, being able to uh, do that virtually, uh, you know, over over the computer, is something that um, you know provides that access, uh, not just for getting the information, but where you would want to get it and how people want to provide that. So I think it's it's accelerated a lot of uh, innovation in the ways that people offer such services, um, a lot of differentiation, a lot of diversity too. So I think it's um it's a wide open field. Uh, to, to be accessed, um, even if you don't really need anything that's necessarily blessed to ask for more information or even a lot of um, like ESL or English as second language teachers I know that are doing a lot of uh, a lot of this tutoring work, they can do that as supplementary uh, as to what's, uh, you know, what's the traditional education. Great. What's our next question, Dave? From Paul Terry Wallace. In Austin, Texas, he's asking, can a student learn with just a phone and not be bound to a desk or place? Go ahead, Dave. Well, I guess my first reaction was yes, uh, they can, but I guess it depends on what you think you want to learn. So if you didn't have a smartphone and you were back in the 60s and they were teaching you from a distance because you lived in a rural area, you could be in the classroom just through the audio and the teacher could address you and you could ask questions if they let time for that. So they found that difficult to do and they also tried it with radio. And then they tried it again with uh, distance video, but that didn't always work. Uh, With respect to a phone, I guess if we looked at smartphones, they've given us terrific opportunities for a student to be traveling to and from a part-time job, sitting on a bus, reviewing material, uh, viewing a lecture or portion of a lecture, Uh, reading up on things, using it to research links that they were given for their lessons. And then when it comes time to be in a classroom, they're prepared Um, or they're following up. They're doing research for homework they will be dealing with later. I think the smartphone has given us a lot of flexibility in terms of place, not a desk. And uh, you weren't always able to have everything at your desk. So you had to consult the library and you had to travel around to consult other people or do labs in other buildings. And so it actually is taking the whole school with you in your hand. Or there's even a story in our Discord channel about some trains that were taking school to students uh, in Canada in the last century. Keely, what are your thoughts? I think that as with many office hours answers, it depends. So there are opportunities, as Dave was talking about, with mobile learning. But what I find is that there's a real uh, benefit to being able to apply what you're learning. So if, for example, I am out for a walk, I can listen to a podcast or listen to a book and I can be learning from that and I can be immersing myself, not just in the words that I'm hearing, but my environment and the activity that I'm doing will create new thoughts and new patterns. But I lack a very easy way to be able to apply what I'm doing. And so, for example, if I'm learning about a piece of software that I could be doing a certain activity with, I can't do that right away. 
And I think there's a big benefit in being able to bring that into your learning process. So I think that if you can, if you can pair those two elements, and if you have a very targeted process for what you're teaching, if it needs application, it needs to be more desk bound, the opportunity at least for split uh, video on your monitor so that you can do what you're learning, do and learn rather than look, pardon me, then learn and do. I think that is just so much more of a powerful thing. So yes, it depends. Thanks. Tony? Yeah, I just wanted to share this with you from our own community. Uh, Dr. Hesma Gajar uh, has the uh, Something to Learn website that he has developed. It was part of the MobiLearn uh, uh, development. And basically what it is, it allows people to learn different um, packages, learn different information through their mobile phone. Everybody has a mobile phone. And he has uh, instructions on how to use the things that are on your phone to do a multitude of different things. He has uh, them in English videos, uh, short videos, animated videos. It is amazing uh, what he is doing. And he, I've had uh, many conversations with him about this and more to come. So stay tuned to STL. Great. Tony, would you be willing to put the link for that in our chat? Absolutely. Thanks. Julian, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm not a big fan of learning on your phone because um, a phone is very distracting, especially for uh, kids and younger students. And um, so if you teach or tutor somebody in a subject, they are not really intrinsically motivated to learn. Um, you have a big problem if they have the phone in their hand. So they are in those situations, it's way better if they can sit at a desk in a designated area where they are used to learn than wandering around and uh, trying to follow it there. And Josh? I think Julian makes a good point about distraction. Um, I have a similar idea in that if that's all that you have is your phone, then fine. Yeah, you, you definitely can learn on your phone. But if you can get something with a larger real estate, larger screen, even if it's a tablet or other screens, I would encourage that because your brain is not a good place to, to store things. It's a good place for working on things. And so having things down where you can see like a blueprint or something you're working off of and then being able to, to work off of a surface, I think certain real estate area is a minimum in order to have certain concepts, maybe not every concept, but a lot of concepts where you where you have really have to see the lay of the land and to see things, having that real estate is, is really a helpful tool if you can, or if you can manage it. Um, and um, I think we made, Julian, I think makes some good points too about having a habit of learning in a, in a particular place, but possible, yeah, possible to learn other places. Yeah, and I think rule number one in building education materials is the form should follow the function. And we'll talk a little bit about that with our next question, Dave. Our next question is from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. Panelists, what would you encourage educators to add to their digital tool belts to use for distance tutoring, software or hardware? What would you add, Dave? Well, I'd encourage teachers to learn more about Google for Education and all of the interact, interacting elements, the uh, class management parts, the material storage and retrieval parts, uh, all of the communication layers, uh, Google systems for uh, nonprofits, education and business all have these interactive bits. They're knitting it together more and more, switching from, you know, their, their Teams video thing. No, it's not Teams, it's Meet uh, for Google. And uh, all of the uh, sort of linking that you can put into documents to give people reach across your materials. Uh, I believe that in the future, Google's going to have this so close together that it would be almost a virtual classroom with all the elements, including live interaction and questions and answers uh, with hundreds of people in a class. What's in your toolbox, Julian? So I recommend a second 
perspective, like um, a top-down view if you have a paper here and you write something very analog. But uh, it also switches it up a little bit for the student if he watches you doing that. Um, even more important when it comes to this question, I would say it is what does the student have? What kind of setup does he have? Um, because can he write something that you can control then as a teacher, as a tutor, that you can check? Um, or does he do it as a phone, um, connecting to the last question? Um, and then it's very tiring looking at a tiny screen, trying to decipher what uh, you just wrote down. So um, I think that's more important than what the teacher actually has. Julian, with your students, do you have a list of system requirements or do you just hear what they have and, and find your way to work around what they have? Uh, we, we just try to make it work somehow. Um, because it, it just switched from going to the student to online teaching when the pandemic hit. So um, we had to make do as everybody had to. And um, of course, I got asked a lot what to get. And I just had an iPad and uh, download good notes. And um, you can put PDFs up there. And that was like a first choice, first reaction to it. Interesting. Guy? Yeah, I would say to get to know the tools, uh, like for instance, with Zoom, a lot of people don't realize that you can give remote control to a student or somebody from afar that can then answer the question. So if you fill out something and you say, now you take over, now they feel way more engaged and involved because they're on the spot and they have to do something. Um, I like the uh, the digital light board, we call it uh, the Wacom tablet. So. You know, if you're doing uh, math problems or th something like that, we use uh, Memo Live to to be able to uh, kick the screen out so it looks cut back over to this. So you can see, like, if I just do is that coming through, let's see, two plus two. So it, it just pops a lot more than if we were to do this on a um, uh, uh, over the shoulder type shot on a camera. Just you could see it so much more vibrant to have a Wacom tablet or an iPad with video pencil, something like that. So uh, I really like uh, using Telestration as as a learning tool. So those are two things that I would I would have. Thanks. What are some other great tools, Keely? I am absolutely going to have to plug Discord a little bit for this. Uh, the move of educational institutions to Discord during the pandemic was one of the reasons that everybody realized that Discord was for more than just gaming. So one of the ways that I've been encouraging server owners and community leaders to use Discord to teach is to go into voice channels, have their workshops and courses in there where students, attendees, participants can actually, all of them could be sharing their screen at the same time. So you could start that at the beginning, everybody can have their screens up and everybody can just pop into each other's screens as they will. You can only see one person's screen share at a time, but if you are the instructor, the leader, you could pop from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And if everybody's sharing their screen for the duration. So for example, a friend of mine, she ran a cook along where she was teaching people cooking courses and they just had their their cameras focused on their counters, she was able to go from each each screen share and see if people were chopping their carrots correctly or whatever the criteria might have been. And it was really effective because people were very engaged. They thought at any time that somebody could pop in and the other participants could pop in and see what they were doing, you know, in their pot. So really fun and engaging ways to get people just interacting more with their content. And I think that can work at, at a ton of levels. And can you see their screen, their camera and their screen at the same time in Discord? Well, if they're using a virtual camera, they can use their uh, they can use their virtual camera to be able to show different things. So, yeah, I stumbled over that explanation, but but that's one of the ways in which people can can do that sort of thing. You'll have to take a look at Discord specifically because I do a lot of training on computer programs, and you can only see one person at a time, or the perplexed look on the participants' faces and kind of guess who's having a, who's struggling. Tony, what would you add? Software-wise, I would add the uh, Google suite of apps, Keynote, uh, on the Apple side. And hardware, I would add, um, a software, I would also add Video Pencil. 
uh, hardware, I would add the Atom Mini because I think it is a great tool. And with, with the price being lowered, I know it's not low enough for a lot of educators, but I would say if you could add that to your tool belt, it is a great device to have. And again, the uh, Mac Mini M2 is a good solution to have to as a resource. And if you don't have those resources, I think you really need a way to see and hear the person clearly and a way to show them things, even if it's just pointing your camera at a piece of paper or a whiteboard. Uh, between those two things, you should have the basics. What's our next question, Dave? It's from Bob Sturdivant and San Antonio. I tutor my grandson and he constantly moves away from the mic. What a surprise. What would be your recommendation for a mic that is not costly and helps with his audio? What do you recommend, Keely? I recommend not a hardware solution. I think we, we look at things that are skill-based and then immediately we want to patch it with something we can buy and give to them. You could talk about a lav mic and, and that's fine. But depending on the age of your grandson, Bob, maybe you're looking at making it a challenge, a game, and a skill that... You, this this person can learn. And so a lot of people, I think, have a disconnect between how they experience being on camera and presenting on audio and what their actual results are. Just shoring that up and, and showing back to your grandson, this is what it sounds like when you keep moving away. That's not cool. Hey, you know, Mr. Beast, do you think he ever moves away from the microphone? Doing something that challenges him and makes him want to be more engaged Hey, you're a content creator when you're on these things. Do you want to put out videos on YouTube? Do you want to do these sort of things? Having better audio skills will help. Let's work on this as a skill and let's make it a game. Let's make it a challenge. It's it's an important skill to have. It's an important skill to learn. So make it that opportunity rather than here, let's buy something that patches that up for you. We don't often think about mic technique as a marketable skill, but I think that's becoming more and more important. Tony? Yeah, I, I was just going to say the $20 pile mic um, with, might be a good solution. Yeah, you also might see if your grandson has already a gaming headset that they use for their uh, PlayStation or whatever. Sometimes you can use those, plug them straight into your device, and they'll work perfectly fine. What's our next question? Our next question is from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, can remote training be delivered in different formats, particularly for disabled folks? Audio only, video with subtitles come to mind. What other delivery mechanisms can you conceive of? Yeah, it certainly can be delivered. Uh, you have to take special consideration for your audience always when you're building training materials. And specifically, some things to think about is, does your tool have the ability to automatically use closed captioning? And most video conferencing tools do. I, I don't know if Zoom does. I assume it does. I know Microsoft Teams does, and it, it does a fair job of uh, captioning the, the video. You also want to make sure that you give adequate time for your learners, and because oftentimes people with special needs take a little extra time, whether it's because the device they're using or because you need to learn how to communicate in a way that they will receive. But Harshid, what are your thoughts on this topic? So the easiest one to me is going to be captioning. Um, we've had products like Life Transcribe and then Apple has also uh, done something similar in their ecosystem to translate text for you quickly. And the challenge here is what is the need for the other person? So I think it also relies what platform you're gaining the information from. YouTube currently does not have audio description as part of their um, package, so to speak, or you can't uh, have a audio description stream and then have it available to others as yet. But, you know, talking to companies like this as Google, YouTube, whomever, uh, to definitely ask for those needs that were, are definitely needed. Um, in learning aspects, the audio description things have helped. I've seen a couple of meetings where a couple of people from National Federation for the Blind were talking and it expressed what they were, who they were, at least what they were wearing or whatnot. And it gave you a little bit of connection to that person that it's a meeting and I get to meet this person almost like I'm meeting them in real life. So, you know, there's other, uh, 
aspects to do, but it's it's more of a learning thing, I think, for all of us. When we do audio description, for example, it's not that we need audio description, but it connects you to the same media. So what happens is you could understand what the person to the left of you or the right of you can understand. So it becomes, it's, and it's also what you perceive at the same time. So, you know, Perception is also a key thing. And in this question, it's more of a perception question, I think. What do you need? Well, someone might need more tools like a uh, AS, uh, American Sign Language interpreter, or you might need uh, a human to translate your text because you don't speak, or you might have autism or other aspects, or you might use AAC, uh, which is uh, augmented uh, audio communication, I think. Uh, I'll try to look it up for you guys but if in that sense is you have tools but it's how do you utilize a tool i might utilize a tool meant for somebody else and you as a sighted person since uh, I'm, I'm vision impaired might use a magnifier totally differently but if it gets the job done any tool is is uh you know relevant to you and it really is a question of what your learners need. I think when we think of disability, we often think of uh, vision or hearing impairment, and that's what most of our solutions are for. But there are lots of different reasons why your learners might have a difficult time uh, acquiring the information and encoding it into their long-term memory. And we need to think about our learners and what they need. Sometimes the solution is to incorporate them in the larger group, and sometimes it's to do a one-off. And when we think of tutoring, since so much of that is one-to-one, -one, you have that opportunity oftentimes to really specialize your instruction towards your learner. Uh, next question, Dave. From Eva Schwartz in Pikesville. Uh, do you think sports in general and swimming specifically could be taught remotely with the specialist at a distance? What equipment would be needed? How would you teach swimming, Dave? You know, I used to make the joke, and I'm from the 80s and 90s, where uh, bandwidth was not there. You couldn't teach phys ed over the net. Um, my feeling has changed, of course, because bandwidth is bigger and you can probably do phys ed over the net. Uh, I'm certainly not a sports expert here because Keely will probably be better at the answer on this one as she already does this sort of thing. But I guess for me, the first reaction I have to the question is that some of these things need a tuned observation and immediate response in order to help the person through what it is they're not doing right. So in the case of swimming, you have you have coaches who walk along beside the swimmer and observe how they're swimming, how their timing works, how much of the stroke they're wasting. And then when they reach the end, they give them tips and they try it again. And that repetition and, and observation is rather difficult in a venue that is the length of a football field or the size of a swimming pool. And I don't know what kind of technology could be used, and I don't think uh, putting a GoPro on their head is going to help the teacher observe what's going on with uh, the person learning. So I'll stop there. And what are you using, Keely? Well, a lot of my instruction right now for field hockey umpires is uh, post-event. It is not live. It is not asynchronous, mostly because you shouldn't be interfering with somebody who's performing an officiating duty at the time and and maybe giving that, them that little feedback. But I can certainly envision th that what I would do is be able to use uh, several cameras. Maybe if you were using a YOLO Live, you could have a few cameras plugged in around the pitch and you could have their audio coming through into that production, you might even have a separate audio channel. You could do it as, as simply as having a WhatsApp call going and be able to communicate with someone who is participating in that event at the time. Um, if I keep going back to Discord, but it it can do these sort of things. I mean, I just described being able to, to, to coach cooks remotely. You could certainly do that with sports as long as you had multiple camera sources that could bring in the, the views that you want. And then being able to feedback live would would absolutely be the way to go. So these are the things that I'm exploring personally in, in my coaching practice. And I know it's just going to get better and easier as the bandwidth increases around and put, putting up GoPros around the pitch or other similar mobile cameras is, is definitely on the near horizon for that sort of uh, remote coaching. I guess I never thought of personal coaching as a form of tutoring, but it really is when you think about it. Julian? So um, as a PE teacher, my first response was, don't do it. Don't uh, go swimming um, remotely, basically, um, because of safety issues. 
like if somebody jumps in the pool and thinks yeah i got the movement um i know how to do it and then it doesn't work you need somebody there to to rescue that person and uh, you need to buddy somebody to pay attention if uh, somebody's going in a pool and is not a secure swimmer so um that was my first response but then like in other sports um dancing for example you can give somebody an idea of a movement um by taking a video of himself and then he can replay this video all the time until he gets it right and then you have um like Kili said this way of interacting he sends a video back uh, your student sends a video back and then you discuss what could be done better or not so leave the laptop out of the pool but maybe review the tape later harshid uh i guess you're not leaving a laptop completely out of the pool uh you have like the galaxy watch for example i just did an android insight call the other day and uh you could set up a mode called swimming and the watch will lock it itself up and go swimming and then once you come out of the pool you hit it again and it spits the water back out and it's interesting that that gives you a metric per se but there are apps as well um, uh, that include a hey let's get steady get ready to run let's get ready to swim and it's a countdown so if you want to have interactivity with you know tutoring as well and you're meeting with a instructor you could meet with the instructor through a phone or as we've mentioned with uh, putting cameras around the pool but then what's the important part is it the data is it the way you're doing the the stroke or what have you and so using watches even as the apple watch ultra or other watches that are out there they're going towards people you know going out and doing sports and actually using it so the metrics of data are all there for you but how do you use those data metrics and the the way i mentioned it with the watch the person that mentioned it is totally blind so how could one blind person go swimming well one thing go learn swimming just for safety first but once you're doing laps you know it's all about the movement it's all about the structure and if you understand that movement okay move your hand left to right or make a pattern or do you know do this do that and that will build a learning uh, atmosphere but at the same time you're going to meet the need of the end user with tutoring them with any kind of hey uh, motivate yourself or you could have them on your watch and they could be screaming at you off their watch like okay you got it one more time one more time and so you could do a lot of things like that yeah josh yeah i, I was thinking that um really it's just the the information can come from afar but um I, Julian made me, made me chuckle a little bit about the, the safety part. See, you, you might be able to have remote learning, but local safety. So that could be a thing. So if you had um, some things like, I would say, um, there are different applications and things where you can analyze things like a golf swing uh, and to get some different metrics. Um, if you had the opportunity for an industry professional to look at your swing and give you tips, would you would you take it? I would. So maybe if there's a way to uh, more disseminate that or allow because of the remote um, uh, reach, having professionals that can guide and I guess we're kind of skewing more towards the, the coaching side of things, but the same thing could be in, in other academic sub subjects. Really, the information just has to come from afar. And some of the things that, you know, it's probably doesn't work for everything, but some of the things that you can mitigate for uh, for being local, um, you could do that don't have to be specialized, like we said, like the local safety thing. Um, and having, I, I wonder if even the example of swimming, if you could have a coach that could help them and say, okay, well, I can see what strokes you're doing and here's what you need to improve um, in, a, in a local pool where people could go to, you, you could probably do something along those lines as well. What are your thoughts, Dave? Well, he stole my golf thing, so I'll, I'll just leave that one and go to the next one. But uh, in terms of individual sports, the sort of coaching aspect is actually quite uh, an opportunity. I think in terms of team sports, uh, and my favorite sport, of course, is hockey. And they've been using video for almost 30 years now. And, and many arenas have a video room for the team. They show up and they sit down and they watch last night's game and take it apart. And then they talk directly about the, the way the team has to operate. The other thing they're experimenting with now, and they haven't authorized this for use generally, but some teams are looking at putting 
earpieces in the helmet during practice. And when they're running their routines or going through their, their practice patterns and their, uh, their basics, uh, the coaches actually can just tune in a player and say, you know, you're making that turn too tight. You want to loosen that up or your stopping is slipping. Go get your skate sharpened. And th they can communicate with them in real time as to watching what they're doing. And I know for some of the individual players, they have teams of people that help them in things like rehab. There's a great documentary done about the rehab of uh, Connor McDavid, where he consulted even psychologists. And he consulted other people who wanted to bring them, uh, bring him back to his scale of play and not be, because he's recovering from an injury, not change the way he skates or shoots or does anything on the ice. And that was an important part of the retraining there. And it's, it's the subtle emotional layer and it's the subtle context in which someone is being taught or is learning. And in terms of distance tutoring, uh, I had an experience where I was actually dealing with disabled people at the post-secondary level and we're tutoring. And most of what the time I spent with them, virtually 50%, was dealing with their emotional reaction to the things that they feel they're missing or have left behind. And I had to... Uh, work with how they felt as much as what they were learning. And when I think about any f form of education, you're really trying to move information from outside of someone's brain into their long-term memory. And, and what it takes is information first, and then some form of practice, and then ideally some sort of reflection on your practice and ultimately applying in the real world. And how do you do that remotely for swimming is going to be significantly different than how you do it in person. Because in person you can have... Uh, for the sake of a crash joke, a, an immersive experience. Uh, what's our next question, Dave? From Douglas Carmichael. Uh, Keeley, you mentioned community-powered courses as being the future of education. Will the traditional lesson plan and rubric become obsolete while Mukana-like community-powered systems become more dominant? Keeley? I think it's funny when you you talk about community power courses being the future, because actually they're the past, the present, and the future. It's just always been one of the best ways to teach. Think about us doing science labs when we were back in school. That was a community-powered course because we had an assignment. We had to do it together. We would collaborate. We would experiment. We would give feedback to each other. And then we'd present our thing and we'd, we'd get some feedback. But we were there cheering for each other, trying to make sure that our volcano bubbled over in the right way, whatever the case might be. and what happens is every time we have a major shift in the tools that we use, we forget about the things, the, the ways in which we were able to community power our learning in that sense. And now we're just adding those skills back in. So I think that it's it's nothing that's new. There's nothing new under the sun. We're just remembering how to do it just in a new setting. And enabling learners to create learning material really helps expand the volume of quality materials and shows it, the material ends up being based on what people actually do instead of what they're told they should do. And so oftentimes your learners have better ways of getting the problem solved than the instructor does, especially in a corporate training environment. What's our next question? Uh, before we go to the next question, I think there was a second hand that might have come up on that last one and it disappeared. So I don't know if someone just inadvertently took their hand off or whether it was uh, taken off without their knowledge. Anyone had a hand up and then took it down? I think that might have been mine. Okay, good. Paul Terry Wallace. Keeley, could you describe your remote teaching process? Oh, won't that be interesting. Uh, what sports do you teach? Sure. There's nothing like being the new girl on the panel. Hey, I'm getting all the questions targeted at me. So my specialty is educating field hockey umpires worldwide, which is a very weird and small niche. But a lot of the techniques I, I use, I think, are, are being incorporated by many other people in the world. There's actually, I've got a friend of mine, his name's Greg Austin. He's down in Texas and he does the same thing with basketball referees. So this is really fun. But one of the main avenues that I use is I use live streams on YouTube where I pull out plays and scenarios that have occurred on live matches over the past week, maybe a few weeks, and people bring them to my attention. Sometimes there'll be an angry social media post about it. And I'll pull out that content. I'll create a clip where I'm able to zoom in. I'll be able to change perspective, maybe draw some 
hard annotations on the screen with distances and things like that. And then I'll lead a discussion on my live stream around that. I have taken to starting a poll at the beginning of a lot of the topics where I ask people, what's the right call or what's the best call in this in this situation? And then I'll show the scenario a few times and start sort of isolating down the facts. And then I take them through a method. Let's apply our principles. What are we looking for in this rule? Let's look at the actual rule in the rule book because a lot of people skip that part. And then we we have a discussion. And for me, the application of the knowledge that I'm trying to build comes from people participating in that live chat. And it seems very basic, but it really is an effective way to get people synthesizing the knowledge that we're trying to teach. And I can spend, I can easily spend an hour talking about one 30 second clip, which probably is a little overkill, but it it's it allows us to really flesh out and touch upon all the different issues. People might extend the hypothetical a little bit. Well, what happens if the player actually does this thing? What would I do? So that's one of my teaching methods. I also will take sort of that very visual clip based approach when I'm teaching a certification course. So I will have examples of the certain rules that I have to teach by rote, but because I'm able to apply, hopefully as best I can, an example of how does this rule actually work in a, a, in a game that helps people absorb the material more. So that's that's the way that I use it. I I think it's it's been a really effective way to build my no luck and trust with my audience. And they also learn the methodology. How do I approach umpiring problems? What's the what's the what are the correct steps that I would go through as a, as a thinker? And hopefully that helps their decision making process down the line. And we're so glad to have both you and Julian here today to talk about people who are actually doing the work. Uh, what's our next question, Dave? From Douglas Carmichael, um, how can elements of distance learning be incorporated into the traditional educational model? I could see some useful applications in teaching world languages, cultures, for example, or connecting classes internationally to learn from each other. Julian? So in my regular English class at school, uh, we have this kind of pen pal program where um, a friend of mine who teaches upcoming teachers in the US um, gives numbers of her students to my students and they talk about some specific subject. My students give a presentation on then in our class. Um, the last big thing was Thanksgiving and they had to like get the information how their pen pal um, yeah, celebrated Thanksgiving with their family and then yeah show us in our class how yeah this very american holiday is celebrated interesting harshid and they did that via skype oh okay harshid? Uh, yeah so i want to take it to music and food those are just fun things in general so food uh if we take it to the cooking hours that we've done here in office hours it's taught us a lot as far as just uh what uh, ingredients are available in certain places. It blew my mind when I realized that uh, lemongrass tea was that that green grass that was in the tea when I was in Africa. But you know, modern day, that's what we called lili chai in, in 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 a different language. But same thing, right? And so when we look at that, it there's a lot of things to learn. I think from different. Uh, elements of either music, uh, you have uh, food. So with with music, we could go Bollywood. How do you dance? You got hip hop. How do different cultures work? You got different styles of music. So how does, you know, New Orleans music with uh, playing with trombones and stuff like that differ from a football marching band that's playing different instruments? So there's, there's different um, elements there that we could really incorporate. Uh, and it can make it fun, right? It's interactive. It's... Uh, finding what we want to work on uh, as a whole. And it also generates a conversation between communities. So if you have someone that's Irish, uh, if you have someone that's Indian, you have someone that's German, uh, you have you know, different um, things that you bring to the table and how do you bring it all together could be just as good as Zoom or Google Meet, uh, Apple, uh, FaceTime, any of that. So it's depending on how you deliver it and how many people you want them to connect and how, if you wanted to make it synchronous, synchronous or asynchronous. 
Thank you. What's our next question? It's from Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C., also on our panel. Do you see a future where using a flipped lecture style will bring experts from anywhere in the world into a real or virtual classroom to answer questions remotely? What do you see, Guy? Uh, John Ilson, who's an educator, uh, PhD, that's been on the panel, was explaining the story of when he um, had the California Parks uh, send a scuba diver down and the feed went out to the classrooms and the students could talk to the guy underwater. And you should, he said, you should see the way that they lit up when they figured out that he could answer directly to them. So if you remember back in school, when you had an onsite guest, you, I mean, you, you really got engaged. And so creating these kinds of experiences where we can send out people and maybe they can do uh, four or five different classrooms in a day, or there is no capacity, you know, maybe it's a thousand person zoom room. So I see a lot of this is getting popular where people can, you know, can not have to fly and travel and get on train a boat to uh, attend a meeting so they can do more of them and get to more uh, people. So I'm excited about it. And what do you see, Keely? Not the future, it's the present. And it's been going on for a while. So even in my little uh, area of the world, I had an umpire at home series during the pandemic where I would bring in an umpire from wherever they were. I had my friend Lynn from Singapore. I had Tomo joining me from New Zealand and all over the place. And I would interview them about a match. So we would talk a little generally about their career and people would be sending questions about their their preparation styles, or what do they think the most important learning experience they had. And then we would go through clips from a match that they had umpired in the fairly recent past. And I have them give their sort of perspective. Yeah, I was sort of thinking about this thing when this happened. And, and actually, this is what the player said to me that the, the cameras didn't pick up and the mics didn't pick up. And, and, you know, I wasn't happy with how I reacted. So when I saw that back on the clip, this is what I've done to correct that problem. So it, it, it's happening already, and it's just one of the, the the great assets that remote education can bring for us. And Dave. Well, then it occurred to me that when we get our virtual glasses, uh, we're going to be immersing in the water with the diver, and the question and answer would be really interesting. The other thing that uh, I thought of is actually in technical training, just as we're doing with office hours where we have people mentoring other people and they watch them do the technical stuff or help them through the clicks of the mouse, it would be really interesting to have live answers from a, a director in a football game or someone handling graphics in a truck and just have a camera on them and let them take questions while they're doing their work. Uh, it would be rather fascinating to see a real world situation brought into the classroom and, and just have you know, grade seven students asking, well, how do you get it onto the scoreboard? And, and when do you decide to do something? And those kind of questions. And what's our last question? From Bob Sturdivant. It's when dealing with remote learning, what are your best tactics, techniques to correct the student's poor behavior or lack of attentiveness? Josh, what are your techniques? Well, I mean, I think we could go into all kinds of carrot or stick uh, analogies, but I think if attention is what's being lost, then you might want to look at why that is the case. So is it something to where um, the way that the information is being presented is not something that's attuned to the way that the person is used to learning? Maybe you could switch up whatever you're doing, maybe try a different approach, or f learn something about the context of the person you're teaching. Um, is there some analogy that you can use? You know, sports analogies work great if people are into sports, but if they're not, then maybe try something else or something that they're used to or apply something in their field of view that can sort of bring things into a greater grasp. Julian? Uh, We're you're not muted, Julian. You, Julian. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I totally agree with what, what Josh just said. Um, you have to plan your lessons so that the students don't even get in the situation to become bored. If it happens anyway, um, do something very unexpected, like play a sound bit or something from a favorite movie, something like that. Just something unexpected to grab the attention back. And I always recommend requiring your students to have their cameras on, uh, especially when you're speaking to them so that you can 
judge their not their body reactions and see if they're glancing off or checking their email while you're trying to instruct them. So um, if you have that ability, I strongly recommend that. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate our panel coming in and giving us your expertise in distance tutoring. Uh, it's been an intriguing conversation, but unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to extend a personal thank you to everyone who keeps the show going, not just our panelists, but our producers too. Each and every morning, there's a group of producers who are putting questions in the chat and voting them up and driving the show, as well as a whole group of people on the back end, a large group of volunteers that help us look good and sound good and make sure that we are providing a high quality product. So thank you, panelists, producers, and back end crew. A show of this quality doesn't make itself and we couldn't do it without you. Typically, we use Saturday for training on office hours. Uh, today, we had Ken Jones, Peter Belbin, and Robert Green learning new roles. And if you'd like to dive in, we'd encourage you to sign up by clicking the link in the daily email. It also has a whole schedule of next week, including special events from the office hours community, like labs, where you can learn even more about topics like accessibility, Canva, Keynote, or even Video Pencil. Today, our cumulative distance between our producer questions was 47,735 mi miles or 432 million bananas. That's, quite a, that's enough to feed quite a large group of typewriting monkeys. We'll see you next week when we discuss storytelling and education, a topic submitted by you, our producers. Thanks, everybody, and check out the credits to see who all was involved in our production today. Thanks all. Great answers, Keely and Julian. Mm -hmm. Don't feel picked on, Keely, because you were new. I think you were just the most uh, informed. And, and Julian as well. Nice to see you first time. I think Julian's been here before. Well, I haven't seen him. That's why I'm uh, notioning. Thanks for bearing with me on the handoff. <laughs>